Welcome, everybody. Today, we have a BioExcel student webinar. It is the webinar corresponding to the Summer School 2021st edition. And we have three presenters. Julian Fernandez from the University of Buenos Aires, Dirash Prakas from the University of Leeds, and Eleonora Gianquinto from the University of Turin. I'm hosting this uh, webinar together with Arno Prum from, from, from the University of Edinburgh and Daniel Thomas Lopez from ABI Manchester. Okay, the today presenter are, uh, first we will have Julian from the University of uh, Buenos Aires and he will speak about uh, small molecule stabilization of a non-native protein-protein interaction of SARS-CoV-2 and protein and as a mechanism of action against COVID-19. Then we, we move to Dirash from the University of Leeds, and he will, we will speak of T-cell now. So he will speak in particular of elucidating the dynamic and the lipid interaction of the T-cell receptor using molecular dynamic simulation and modeling. So now I will start to give the word to Julian. Hello and welcome all to this My Excellent Student Webinar. As Alessandra said, my name is Julian Fernandez uh, and, I, and today I will be presenting my work called Small Molecule Stabilization mm -hmm. of Non-Native Protein-Protein Interactions of SARS-CoV-2 and Protein as a Mechanism of Action Against COVID-19. This work was done together with my PI, Martin Lavecchia from the National University of La Plata and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. To, give, to begin with, let me set you in context to, to understand why did we choose the end protein as a drug target against coronavirus. As we all know, on December 2019, the COVID-19 outbreak happened, and since then, drug repurposing emerged as the fastest way to find a therapy, with many groups around the world targeting the same viruses drug targets. Later on, February last year, this article was published in the Journal of Medicine and Chemistry, and it was the first report of a novel mechanism of action against coronaviruses that involved the stabilization of non-native protein-protein interactions of the nucleocapsid protein, and, and they use MERS coronavirus as a model. A couple of days later, the first crystal structure of this of the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein was released, and when we saw these results, we wonder if it was possible to exploit the same mechanism of action against SARS-CoV-2. Now let me move on to the main characteristics of this protein. Its main functions are related to RNA manipulation, being in the packaging of the RNA genome into ribonucleoproteins, and the regulation of viral RNA synthesis during replication and transcription. Regarding the protein's structure, it is made of two domains, the N-terminal domain, that's the one we work with, and the C-terminal domain that are bonded by a highly disordered linker. Both domains are capable of interacting with RNA, but the CTD is the only one that participates in the protein's oligomerization. Before telling you what we effectively did, uh, let me comment a little bit on the mechanism of action that was published in this paper. This is the same paper I mentioned before, and this is its graphical abstract. Here we, we can see domain number one will be the C-terminal domain that is responsible for the protein oligomerization, and the N-terminal domain will be the red one, which is the one we work with. The authors propose that by using a small molecule, it is possible to stabilize non-native protein-protein interactions that could cause an abnormal aggregation of the, prote of the protein and consequently have some therapeutic effect. They also published three crystal structures that we use as a model. One was a ligand-free dimer, and the other two were with different ligands that are uh, this one that are presented in the slide, that are P1 and P3. Now let's move on to what we effectively did. I divided my presentation into three parts. One was the modeling, one is the modeling of the previously reported MERS coronavirus results. Here we developed a methodology that we validated with MERS coronavirus, and then we could apply that same methodology to the next part that will be interface selection. Here I will tell you how did we select those dimers that we were going to stabilize. And finally, I will tell you a little bit about our drug repurposing approach, where we implemented a drug discovery protocol that consisted mainly on docking, molecular dynamics, and free energy calculations. Um, to begin, let's begin with the first part. Um, regarding the modeling of the previously reported MERS coronavirus results, 
We implemented a methodology that consisted mainly on molecular dynamics and free energy calculations. Here we had to take into account that the stabilization of protein-protein interactions by small molecules is a consequence not only of ligand dimer interactions, but also interactions between both monomers that could be induced by the ligand, but where the ligand is not being part of that interaction. This was encountered by using what we call the total interaction energy, that is the independent sum of the energy between the ligand and the dimer, and the energies between the interactions between residues of, mono of each monomer, where the ligand is not involved. We use this methodology to simulate the free crystal structures that were reported, observing that all of them were stable in our simulations with energy values that were in good correlation with the reported biological activity, and we also noticed that the uh, P1 ligand was not even able to stabilize the ligand-free interface according to our energy values. Moving on to the second part of my talk, uh, which, which is interface selection. This was quite a difficult task since there are many non-native dimers that can be built with two monomers of the same protein, and not all of them are equally likely to be induced by small molecules. So in order to select those dimers that we were, we are, we were going to stabilize, we had to rely on the few experimental data that we had. This was the first crystal structure that was reported that I mentioned before. Uh, it consisted on a tetramer built with two interfaces that we call interface one and interface two, and, and that were bonded by a zinc ion. Also, uh, the other experimental data was the previously reported MERS coronavirus stabilized dimer, uh, where we, by homology modeling, we were able to build what we call interface free. Using the same methodology we applied to MERS coronavirus, we could simulate these free systems, finding that uh, the only stable interface was interface number one, which is in correlation with the energy values, and the other two were unstable. We also wondered which was the role of the zinc ion in these structures, since at that time there were many authors publishing papers looking for uh, using salts from different metals uh, that could be used as antivirals. So when we saw the zinc ion in the crystal structure, we found interesting to understand what was uh, the zinc doing there. So uh, our simulation suggested that it was effectively stabilized in the crystal structure and it was not just an artifact of the crystallization protocol. Moving on to the final part of my talk, which is drug repurposing. Here we had to uh, develop some methodology that was based mainly on molecular dynamics because of the high mobility of the systems. It began with interface selection, the same thing that I have just told you. Then we moved to cavity generation, where we uh, ran short molecular dynamics until pocket revelation. Once we had our binding sites, we could run molecular docking using the DragBand database and OpenEyes FRED software. We ran docking across all interfaces, selecting the most promising compounds upon a consensus docking score that prioritizes those molecules that had the best interactions across all systems. Then we ran short molecular dynamics to easily discover unstable complexes, and then the remaining ones were extended until equilibrium. Until equilibrium. Finally, we performed free energy calculations and uh, progression is the composition in order to identify key interactions. Regarding the results of this methodology, our molecular docking showed a common catechin skeleton between most of the best candidates. So we wonder if this was because it was a privileged scaffold or just because of its polyphenolic structure that was giving these molecules some non-specific interactions between the, in the interface. Uh, to answer this question, we added a specific polyphenol database to our simulations and ran docking again, observing that catechins remain as the best scored compounds among all polyphenols. We also found that many of these compounds had already been tested against SARS-CoV in 2012 with very good correlation between the reported activity in that paper and our consensus document score position. Also, moving, finally moving to the, our molecular dynamics results, in this table we can see the total interaction energy value of each ligand in each interface. If we take a look at interface one, we can see that all ligands, but bad mass of protocol, were able to stabilize this uh, this dimer, which was stable in the ligand-free simulation. But all energy values of the ligands that could stabilize it were lower than the one that we obtained there, but higher than the one that we had uh, when we ran our simulations with the zinc ion. This was not the case for interface two, where all ligands were able to stabilize this dimer, which was unstable when it was isolated. And several compounds were able to reach energy values that were lower than the one we obtained with zinc. I also added this last column to, to the table, which is the SARS-CoV reported activity, 
where we found that there was good correlations between our total interaction energy value between interface one and interface two, but it was not the case for interface three. We can see here an active compound that, that was unable to stabilize this interface. And this can be explained if we take a look at our perversity energy decomposition. Here I highlighted in red, uh, in pink, the RNA binding residues, which are the ones that are responsible for the protein's main functions. The fact that the, uh, that the ligands that stabilize interface free were unable to have some th therapeutic effect may be because the, uh, because the because of the fact that the protein is still capable of maintaining its, its main functions since non-RNA binding residues are involved in that stabilization. So these were our results. As a summary, the potential applicability of against SARS-CoV-2 of a mechanism of action that has been recently validated was analyzed. Uh, this was done by modeling previously reported experimental results, selecting those dimers, those non-native dimers that could be stabilized, running virtual screening using easy to access compounds, and selecting the ones that are most promising for exploiting this mechanism of action. Finally, I would like to thank my two PIs for, for helping with, with, the, with this work. Martin is responsible for the computational part of my thesis, and he did all this work with me. Jorge uh, is responsible for the experimental part of my thesis and he encouraged me to do this work with Martin. Also, thank, to, thank you to all the, my lab colleagues with, for the helpful discussions, for the University of Buenos Aires for my PhD fellowship, all, my funder, all our funders for our infrastructure that we use uh, for our simulations, also to BioExcel for the amazing summer school we attended and for letting me share my work. And finally, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. And now we move on to Diash. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, initial introduction and hope you all enjoyed uh, your Leon's talk. Uh, today, I'm going to be telling you about uh, my research on the dynamics and lipid interactions of the T cell receptor using multi scale molecular dynamic simulations and modeling. Uh, here, I have a nice uh, image. Uh, trying to portray what the T-cell surface might look like. T-cell receptors shown in blue and co-receptors in, in, in purple and a small sneak peek on the intracellular side with cytoskeleton. So, to give you a broad background uh, of the immunological side of it, uh, let's say you have uh, a small cut in your skin and you have a small invasion of bacteria so you have, you're going to have dendritic cells uh, coming from in your capillary trying to reach out for these antigens and try to swallow them. What's going to happen next is that they're going to interact with T cells and the antigens that were swallowed by these dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells are going to be uh, broken down and a small peptide or fragment of this antigen is going to be presented uh, using an MHC molecule to the T cell receptor on the plasma membrane of T cells. Uh, there are different types of t-cells and but i won't go into too much detail of that uh, what my research focuses on is, is this part which is the initial phase of uh, t-cell signaling and what i'm going to be talking to you today about is the structure and dynamics of the tcr and the lipid interactions so here's what we know and we don't know about the t-cell receptor so there have been many uh, experimental and computational studies uh, uh, about the T cell, T, T cell receptor and PMHC interactions. And we also have a good knowledge of the T cell signaling pathway and uh, the proteins involved in getting the signal from the receptor and into the nucleus. Uh, we also know uh, about the structure of the T cell receptor, uh, thanks to the Nature paper and the cryo-EM study, uh, which, was, uh, which solved the structure at 3.7 uh, angstroms. Uh, but in this study, they, the authors could not solve for the uh, cytoplasmic region because we know that um, it is unstructured and it is potentially very dynamic. And why it is important to study this cytoplasmic region is because it's uh, constituted by 400 residues out of 1,500, which is uh, almost one third of the structure. And more than that, it is responsible for binding proteins and initiating signaling. So what we did uh, in this paper published in PLOS Computational Biology recently was that we took the cryo-EM structure, uh, we modeled some missing uh, residues in the extracellular region, but most more importantly, we modeled 
the cytoplasmic tails in this particular manner, in a linear manner, so that we avoid bias in protein, protein, and protein lipid interactions at the very beginning of the simulations. So here in the electrostatic profile, you can see that uh, there is a very dense blue patch here in the cytoplasmic tails, which are which represents the electropositive uh, region of the cytoplasmic tail. And this is another reason why we should study the cytoplasmic uh, tails because these could very strongly interact with negatively charged lipids. So after obtaining the complete structure of the T-cell receptor, uh, we inserted it into a complex asymmetric membrane uh, whose lipid composition was uh, was derived from this study um, with a lipidomic study of the lipid species found natively in the T-cell a receptor activation domain. So using this, we conducted co-screen simulations, uh, five replicates of five microseconds each, and we observed that uh, the tails uh, associated with the membrane. And uh, using the final snapshot of these co-screen simulations, we further conducted uh, atomistic simulations or all atom simulations uh, for 250 nanoseconds into three replicates. But we also wondered whether these co-screen simulations sort of um, had a sort of, had, you know, created a bias for in this membrane association phenomena. So at the very beginning of the sim of the of, of the simulations, we also conducted uh, atomistic simulations and we compared the, the results between coarse grain and atomistic, which turned out to be consistent. So we now know that there was uh, no sort of uh, artifacts in the protein protein interactions and membrane association. Um, moving on to the results, uh, this we know that uh, the cytoplasmic tails uh, exhibited uh, coil and membrane-bound uh, state. But in addition to this, what was uh, the most the more awaited piece of information is that the structural configuration, uh, what what how it looks like the structural configuration of the tails. So here, uh, using 20 microseconds of Coarse grain simulations, uh, we extracted 10,000 configurations, uh, grouped them into clusters using an RMST cutoff. And uh, after performing clustering, basically the cluster which had the most number of structures indicated the most uh, representative configuration of the tails. And this, this is what I have indicated in the box here. In addition to that, um, the lipid interactions, uh, our lipid interaction analysis showed that PIP2 and PIP3 interactions were the most distinct. Uh, it was very striking that they formed a sort of an annulus around the receptor, uh, given their uh, highly negative, uh, electronegative uh, nature, uh, followed by POPS, which was not as negative. So they didn't exactly uh, dominate uh, over the PIPs. Uh, we also found a strong cholesterol binding site, uh, which occurred at this site here, the behind the alpha uh, subunit. And uh, regarding the PIP interactions, we wondered what exactly it was, which part of the receptor kind of caused this phenomenon of uh, PIP lipid annulus. So we uh, simulated just the transmembrane domain. We simulated the extracellular and the transmembrane domain. And then finally, the, uh, the, the complete uh, structure with the cytoplasmic tails. So as you can see here, that in presence of the cytoplasmic tails, the pip lipid interactions actually increase at least twofold. So, so then we uh, proposed that it was actually the cytoplasmic tails that kind of enhanced uh, these lipid interactions and lipid environment around the receptor. Uh, we also calculated residence time, uh, and we saw that pip2 actually spent a lot of time uh, attaching to uh, the residues without detaching. So the average time that they interacted without detaching was highest for PIP2 lipids. Uh, this is another interesting aspect, uh, an important aspect of the T-cell receptor, which is membrane penetration of cytoplasmic tyrosins. So experiments have uh, shown that experiments using uh, small peptides containing tyrosins did show that the uh, tyrosins do penetrate in, in into the hydrophobic core of the membrane. But what remained as a question was whether all the tyrosins do the same when you have the whole T cell receptor complex in one piece. So here we uh, we show that uh, that there, there were some tyrosins uh, in, in penetrating the membrane, which was consistent with experimental results. 
but we also see that a few tyrosins uh, transiently exposed themselves to the solvent. And we found that this was consistent with the basal signaling phenomena, which means that the T cell receptor does signal, but at a very minimal level, even in its resting state. Finally, um, moving on from the cytoplasmic region, uh, given the dynamic uh, simulations that we have, it was also important to look at whether there were any conformational changes. So here we show the extracellular uh, conformational changes. Uh, so in our simulations, we see that uh, it sort of shows this closed state, an intermediate state, and then an open state. So this is what we see in the cryo-EM structure. And uh, given that we also observe this closed state, we also identified extra, uh, this, these additional protein-protein interactions between the variable domain and the constant domain, which was not seen in the cryo-EM. Uh, and moving on to the transmembrane region, we again saw these conformational changes where these two subunits, the epsilon and the zeta one, move away from each other, and the delta and beta subunits move towards each other. Uh, as in, the, the structure was sort of relaxing itself uh, in the in the membrane, in contrast to the de detergent environment that the cryo EM study used. So given given the conformational changes that we saw in the extracellular, the transmembrane, and the cytoplasmic tails uh, previously, uh, we sort of propose that this could be an, an allosteric mechanism of an of T cell receptor activation in in a broad sense. So to, to summarize, we're going to watch a movie. First, you see the conformational change in the extracellular domain from the open to the closed, and then you see cholesterol binding very tightly to the transmembrane domain, followed by PIP interactions shown in orange and red surface, and then you see cytoplasmic uh, tyrosins shown in green spheres uh, penetrating the membrane, while the others are hidden within uh, the coil. Uh, this movie you see is about uh, three microseconds, starting from one microsecond uh, time. So going into the future, I think, uh, we it is important to study the clustering and organization of T cell receptors along with lipids uh, in, a, in a very large system. And we could also build a complex system with so the T cell receptor, uh, co-receptors, inhibitors, uh, LCK, which is a very important protein uh, playing a role in the phosphorylation mechanism, trying to uh, move the signal from the membrane to the intracellular site. And we could also have act actin cytoskeleton uh, in, in a large complex system. And this will actually help us uh, simulate activation models that have been suggested by experiments so far. Finally, uh, I'd like to thank uh, my group members, uh, my supervisors, Andreas, Kelly, uh, Graham Cook, and uh, my collaborators, uh, or Professor Oreste Okuto at Oxford, who provided very useful inputs uh, into this paper, and Professor Omar uh, Dashek, who collaborated with us to study TCR-PMHC interactions, which I did not talk about today. And finally, uh, supercomputing facilities without which uh, nothing of the nothing would be possible. Uh, last but not the least, uh, BioExcel team uh, for a fantastic summer school experience and for the opportunity for me to give this talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much.